Well, good morning. Welcome, Grace Church, this morning. We're so glad that you are here. Welcome to all those joining us online. Thank you for joining us, and uh, we are glad that you are here, worshiping with us today. If you are new to Grace, if you could do a couple things for us first, go back to our connections booth in the back. We've got a, a gift for you, uh, one of our brand new coffee mugs that you can uh, get for free if you're a guest, and uh, in it is a coupon for a free espresso drink down at our Shot of Grace Cafe that is open between services, so uh, you wouldn't be able to get your drink today, but save it and cash it next week for a free espresso drink or Italian soda. And uh, also we have a packet of information about our church we would love to give you. Uh, also, if you could fill out a connection card for us, uh, they are in the chairs and chair backs in front of you, and uh, put down as much information as you feel comfortable sharing with us, and uh, then put those in one of the donation boxes by each of the exits on your way out. And uh, it's just a way for us to know that you are here. And uh, if you are a regular attender or member, please also fill out those cards. You can just jot your name down or you can check in on the church center app uh, and it really helps us to know who was here each Sunday because we have two services balcony main floor and all those things so uh, please let us know that you were here this morning that will really help us also want to let you know uh, as you probably have heard if you've been here for a while um, there is a telephone number that will be on the screen that you can text questions into and normally each week Pastor West and myself uh, record a podcast called Weekend Debrief where we talk through those questions that is going to be on hold for a month as I'm going to be uh, in and out of, uh, of Dallas for this month. I've, in five weeks, I'm going to be visiting three different states. Uh, we've got some uh, Harbor Network training events, and uh, I'm guest speaking at, a, at one of the Harbor Network churches uh, that we're connected with. Uh, Amy and I are also taking our girls on a, on a short vacation. So we're going to be in and out of uh, town and out, in and out of the state for this month. So we're going to be holding on to those questions, and we will answer them. Uh, at the end of the month, at the end of May or early June when we start recording again. So please continue to text those questions in. Just know they won't be answered right away. But with, uh, with being out of town, we've got some great uh, speakers lined up, uh, some of our pastors, as well as one of our uh, Harbor Network church planters who has planted a church in Salem will be with us next week. So a lot of great stuff coming up. We want to tell you about more of it. So here is your Grace News for the week. today about a couple awesome opportunities that are coming up. The first one is on May 4th, which is the National Day of Prayer. And that is where people gather all over the nation to pray. And so we're going to be having a prayer service and worship night here on that day on May 4th. It's a Thursday night, 6 to 7 p.m. So join us in the sanctuary as we just gather around, we pray, uh, sing some worship songs. So again, that's on Thursday night, May 4th, from 6 to 7 p.m. And also, we have another opportunity. If you would like to be baptized, the end of May, we're going to be having a special baptism service for those that are interested. So talk to the office or talk to one of the pastors. Uh, fill out a card if you are interested at all in baptism and what that is. And so you can find out more information um, by talking to us. And then oh, if you want to stand up and just declare that you are a believer in Jesus, there's nothing better than that seeing baptisms happen here on Sunday morning. So make sure and, and fill out a card or, or talk to one of us about that. So come to prayer night. And if you're interested in baptism, thanks for listening. Thank you so much for joining us this weekend. We are so glad to have you. Just a couple reminders, if you want to text in a question about anything we talked about today, there will be a telephone number on the screen during the sermon. It's an anonymous text line, so feel free to text any question in, and each week on our Weekend Debrief podcast, we will be answering those questions. Also, if you want to contribute to the Mysteries of Grace Church, you can use the giving envelopes and put them in the donation boxes on your way out. We also have an online giving, and you can also give through the Church Center app. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your and let's stand together, and uh, as we start today, I wanted to read out of uh, Psalm 119. And as we read today, this is kind of a, a prayer. And so I want to invite you uh, just to close your eyes as you hear these words. Um, as I read out of, out of Psalm 119, uh, verses 33 through 37. Let's close our eyes and, and pray this together. Teach me, Lord, 
the way of your decrees, that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me in the path of your commands, for there I find delight. Turn my heart toward your statutes and not toward selfish gain. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. Preserve my life according to your word. Amen. Love in there, it says, turn my heart towards your statutes or your law. Turn my eyes away from worthless things. And so we want to start off today, this song we haven't done for a while, but uh, just saying I want to live with abandon. I want to give you all that I am, every part of my heart, uh, that, that chasing after this world, it just makes us tired, that when we try to praise our own name, it, it says it leaves me dry. There's got to be more to life than this. I'm not looking at
talk about that uh, God is mighty to save, that we need his mercy, his compassion every day. Everyone needs some passion, love that's never failed. Then man will see fall on peace. Anyone needs forgiveness, kindness of a savior. The cold blood nations. Sing out, Savior. praise your name. We thank you, Jesus, that you are mighty to save, that uh, when we are lost, we were lost in our sins. Jesus, you made a way. That you are the way maker, that you keep your promises. And as we trust in you, we want to hear from your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's remain standing as Aubrey's going to read for us today. Good morning. Today we'll be reading 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. Brothers and sisters, consider your calling. Not many who were wise from a human perspective, not many powerful, not many of noble birth. Instead, God has chosen what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and God has chosen what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world, what is viewed as nothing, to bring to nothing what is viewed as something, 
so that no one may boast in his presence. It is from him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom from God for us, our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption, in order that as it is written, let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for today. I just pray that you um, be with us, that you would give him the words to speak, that we would all have open hearts and open minds as we hear your word. I thank you for this day, um, and I pray that you um, give us all a great week, that we all be safely from here. In Jesus' name, amen. Are we good now? All right, there we go. Good morning. It's good to see you here this morning. Uh, we're going to be continuing our sermon series through um, the heroes of the faith pointing to the ultimate hero. And uh, we're going to find ourselves today in Judges chapter 3. Uh, but before we, we dive into that story and, and we talk about um, Ehud, the left-handed man, um, one of the things this this story in Judges 3 reminds me of is a type of movie that, that I love to watch. And, and they're action-packed movies with twists and turns. And it made me think of Mission Impossible. You know, you got, got Ethan Hunt, who has received the, the call from headquarters on, uh, on his mission, should he choose to accept it. And uh, you know that somehow the good guy is going to win, just not sure how it's all going to play out. And uh, Ethan Hunt, uh, played by Tom Cruise, he, he takes up his mission. Uh, the mission, he's called out to save a people, a country, his friends, ultimately save the world. Because uh, if he doesn't do it, then we're all going to die. Um, but then once he makes his first move, there's a team there to support him. And it's, it's similar to what we're going to be looking at today in, in our text from Judges. It kind of has that same feel of here's the story, and then, and then our hero steps in, and, uh, and that's what we're going to see. Now, what we need to know about the book of Judges. One is that this, this book can have some pretty intense stories, and today's will be one of those. Um, the real, uh, real accounts that happen. Um, just like an action movie, you have to prepare yourself. You know that um, things are going to happen and they're intense, and, and uh, so just prepare yourself, okay? Um, but the other thing we need to know about the judges that, are, that we're going to be reading about is they are not like the judges of today. They're not like, they didn't, their names weren't presented, they don't sit before a hearing committee, and uh, be vetted and be asked all these questions and then voted on. If No, these, these judges were warriors. And when they were called, they were called to go in and conquer and lead the people. They just didn't sit with robes on and people brought them their issues to solve. So just know that as we, as we head in. Uh, if you haven't yet turned to Judges 3... Uh, go ahead and do so. We're going to start in verse 12, and we're going to read through verse 30. It's a little bit longer section, but this story needs to be read in its entirety. So I want you to be thinking about um, some key moments uh, in this story, some different turning points, and, uh, and then we'll unpack it as we, uh, as we go along. So Judges 3, starting in verse 12, going through verse 30. The Israelites again did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He gave King Eglon of Moab power over Israel because they had done what was evil in the Lord's sight. After Eglon convinced the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join forces with them, he attacked and defeated Israel and took possession of the city of Palms, which is Jericho. The Israelites served King Eglon of Moab 18 years. Then the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and he raised up Ehud, son of Gera, a left-handed Benjamite, as a deliverer for them. The Israelites sent him with the tribute for King Eglon of Moab. Ehud made himself a double-edged sword 18 inches long. 
he strapped it to his right thigh under his clothes and brought the tribute to King Eglon of Moab, who was an extremely fat man. When Ehud had finished presenting the tribute, he dismissed the people who had carried it. At the carved images near Gilgal, he returned and said to King Eglon, I have a secret message for you. The king said, Silence, and all his attendants left him. Then Ehud approached him while he was sitting alone in the upstairs room where it was cool. Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And the king stood up from his throne. Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh, and plunged it into Eglon's belly. Even the handle went in after the blade. And Eglon fat closed in over it, so that Ehud did not withdraw the sword from his belly, and the waist came out. Okay, that SB is very polite in how it said that. Um, a whole bunch of stuff came out. It was nasty. All right. Ehud escaped by way of the porch, closing and locking the doors of the upstairs room behind him. Ehud was gone when Aegon's servants came in. They looked and found the doors of the upstairs room locked and thought he was relieving himself in the cool room. Of course, because of what we read earlier, stuff came out. The servants waited until they became embarrassed and saw that he had still not opened the doors of the upstairs room. So they took the key and opened the doors, and there was their lord, Lying dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while the servants waited. He passed the Jordan near the carved images and reached Sarah. And after he arrived, he sounded the ram's horn throughout the hill country of Ephraim. The Israelites came down with him from the hill country, and he became their leader. He told them, follow me, because the Lord has handed over your enemies, the Moabites, to you. So they followed him captured the fords of the Jordan leading to Moab and did not allow anyone to cross over. At that time, he struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all stout and able-bodied men. Not one of them escaped, and Moab became subject to Israel that day, and the land had peace for 80 years. Well, let's pray, and we'll talk about what this means for us this Ehud, the left-handed man who goes in and assassinates a king and amongst all the nastiness. What, is it, what does it have to do with us? So let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your word. We thank you that it is um, many times just straightforward. And, and uh, although we may wonder why it's in your word, Lord, I, I thank you that uh, you give us context to help us understand. Um, and Lord, I pray that as we go through and, and we look at these passages, uh, Lord, would you make it clear to us? Would you speak to our hearts as to what you have for us this morning? And uh, we pray that you would be honored and glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 12, the first thing that we see is we see a people in disobedience. And there's, there's three points to the message, and then we're going to kind of summarize everything with a really important kind of capstone of, of what we're talking about here. But these first two segments are like when Ethan Hunt gets the call and puts the glasses on, right? Have you seen the movies, the glasses, or he gets the tape or whatever, and the word comes from headquarters that says, this is background information, here's, here's the scenario. Well, these first two points are giving us the scenario, and it's important for us to have this background information to understand where we're, where we're going. And so right at the start in verse 12, we see a people that are in disobedience. And verse 12 tells us that the Israelites again did what was evil in the Lord's sight. So if they did something again, that means they've already done it before. And we look at the passage ahead and uh, verses 7 through 11 tell us that Othniel was the first judge that was sent. And Othniel came in, he rescued the people. Um, and there was peace on the land for 40 years, and then Othniel died. And then there is some time, we don't know exactly how much time, between ele verse 11 and verse 12. But after Othniel died, then the Israelites again did what was evil in the Lord's sight. And if we think back to 
um, the Red Sea, or uh, the uh, when the Israelites had left and they're wandering in the desert, and and maybe even before then, we think back to last week of of Joshua and Caleb, and they're going out and spying the land that that Dave talked about, and ten out of the twelve are like, we can't do it. They took their eyes off of the Lord, and we can't do it. Um, we see that uh, through the the time wandering in the desert. There were times where. Um, well, the Lord always provided for him, but then the people became, uh, they, they grumbled and they complained and they took their eyes off of the Lord and they faced, uh, they faced some discipline. And, and this is the cycle that we have seen. And, and so to kind of help us understand uh, from where we were in the desert to where we are now, we, we look back to chapter 2. And this really, at the, at the base of what this issue is, the sin issue, we look at uh, chapter 2, verse 2. It says, you are not, this is a, an angel of the Lord speaking to the people, you are not to make a covenant with the inhabitants of this land. Pretty straightforward, right? Like if God can only be clear, he was clear. Do not make a covenant uh, with the inhabitants of this land. Number two, you are to tear down their altars. Pretty clear. The third thing, but you have not obeyed me. What is this you have done? Therefore, I now say, I will not drive out these people before you. They will be thorns in your sides, and their gods will be a trap for you. When the angel of the Lord had spoken these words, all the Israelites, the people went loudly, and they named the place Bacham and offered sacrifices there to the Lord. Previously, so now we're going to take a kind of a step back. Previously, when Joshua had sent people away, the Israelites had gone to take possession of the land. We're in verse 6, each of his own inheritance. Verse 7, the people worshiped the Lord throughout Joshua's lifetime and during the lifetime of the elders who outlived Joshua. They had seen all the Lord's great works uh, that he had done for Israel. Joshua, son of Nun. The servant of the Lord died at the age of 110. They buried him in the territory of his inheritance in Timoth Haras, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the Mount of Mount Gash. That whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. Joshua's generation, the generation after, gathered to their ancestors, another way of saying they died. Okay? After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works. He had done for Israel. That should strike us. And, and we could probably spend an entire message easily just on those verses of the implication of an entire generation not knowing the Lord and the responsibility of one generation to the next. But this helps us to see the pattern. Uh, this image is from the Bible Project. Uh, they've got a great... Um, a uh, great summary of Judges 3, if, if you want to take a look at that. But, but this, this diagram really helps to kind of give us a visual of the Israelites and, and their cycle of sin. This was not just a one-time thing. This continues on. And so they have sin in their land. They, they worship other gods. And because of that sin, they fall under oppression. We see that with King Eglon, right? So they... Uh, they turn away from the Lord, they take their eyes off the Lord, they start worshiping other gods, and they fall under oppression. So God's discipline, the consequences of their sin. And we see in these stories, it's, it gets bad enough, and they cry out to the Lord, and they repent. Uh, repent is just, they're going one direction, and repentance says, I'm going to stop going this way, I'm going to turn 180 degrees, and I'm going to go this way, go towards God. And so they make a heartfelt, conscious decision, we're going to turn back to God. God sends them a deliverer, rescues them. Then they live at peace and everything's good. And then they start the cycle over again. They take their eyes off of the Lord. And this is a continual process. We think, why, why couldn't they get it? Why could they not get it? It seems so clear. We can look at it, and we know that uh, hindsight is 2020. We have the luxury of history and looking back and go, well, duh, Israelites, 
You're just doing the same thing over and over again. Why don't you get it? Well, before we come down too hard on the Israelites, we should probably stop and take stock of ourselves. And how often do we find ourselves in those same patterns? And we just can't see it. We don't have the perspective. While someone else, I think this is a, a, a really important thing, that why it is so important that we have other people in our lives that can speak into our lives, that have that perspective to say, mm, you might want to step on the brakes here. You're, you're headed in a direction that is not, not God-honoring or not healthy. Somebody that might have a different perspective. Well, the Israelites were stuck in the middle, and they couldn't see the mess that they were in. But I'd like to just challenge us to think through not just identifying those patterns in our lives, but what are the implications for living this way? What are the implications for us living in this sin cycle? And, and it's not necessarily one particular sin. We could, we could just simply say, big picture, 30,000 foot view, Sin is, is taking our eyes off of the Lord and doing something that we want and not honoring God. Whether it's pride or, or anything along that lines. But what are the implications of living in this cycle? Well, we see for the Israelites in chapter 2, verse 10, after that whole generation ha had died, after them another generation rose up who did not know the Lord. Or the works that he had done for Israel. See, when we are caught in a cycle of sin and we don't deal with it, and we don't recognize it, the implications go beyond just our personal walk. It has a ripple effect. It affects those that are closest to us. It affects those around us. We're going to continue to see that. For me personally, what this cycle looks like is stress and anxiety in my life. When I take my eyes off of the Lord and take off, take my dependence on Him, and, and I, I take that daily dependence and I'm not focused on the Lord, stress, anxiety, and its effects begin to rule my life. Now, because I'm a slow learner, I have learned that there are certain key phrases that I tell myself that throw up red flags. And I have a wonderful wife who, lovingly will remind me when I'm headed down this path. But when I start telling myself, I got this, I can do it, it's not a big deal. I, come on, I can, I can take care of it. I've got this, I'll handle it. Um, you need me to do, I'll do that. And pretty soon I've got all these plates spinning and, and I'm feeling pretty good about myself. Well, then the plates start crashing down because you can't do that. And then all of a sudden, the effects are, I start looking at myself differently, and I view myself through how successful I feel like I'm being, instead of viewing myself through the eyes of God and a child of God. But when I do that, it not only affects me, it affects, um, it affects my family, my temperament changes, how I, how I respond to people changes. My witness to others is affected. <clears throat> so it has bigger, bigger implications. When things are good, we are prone to wander. That's really where the Israelites get. That's where we get. If we go through a difficult time sometimes and, and we're at peace and things are good. We're kind of like on cruise control. But as the old hymn says, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Take my heart, O oh, take and seal it with thy spirit from above. Rescued thus from sin and danger, purchased by the Savior's blood. May I walk on earth a stranger as a son and heir of God. May we not be a people prone to wander. Or be aware of that is to stop this, this process and keep our eyes on the Lord. 
So not only were these people, Israelites, a people of disobedience, but because of their disobedience, they were a people oppressed. Verses 13 and 14, Eglon convinced the Ammonites and the Amalekites to join forces with him, to, to build an alliance. And he attacked and defeated Israel and took possession of the city of Palms. The Israelites served King Eglon of Moab for 18 years. Well, we see that at the end of Othniel, the first judge, there was 40 years of peace. Things were going great for 40 years. And then they turned, they, they continued their cycle, and for 18 years, King Eglon was ruling over them. Now, he is described in verse 17 uh, that he was an extremely fat man. And we can surmise, it doesn't tell us specifically, but based on the information that we have, we can surmise that this is not a, it's not a, um, an exaggeration of, of who he is, but it is a picture of, um, as a king, he was a very self-indulgent man. He was living off the fat of the land, off of the backs of the Israelites. See, as a king in that time, they would expect these tributes to be brought to them. So whether that was produce, whether that was money, whether it was uh, meat from animals or whatever, but it was kind of like, me, 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 bring it to me. And he, he lived off the fat of the land. But it's interesting in this, in this text, it's not just Eglon. He also invites others to join him in the oppression of the Israelites. And it's significant in who he invites that we need to spend just a little bit of time talking about them so that we get this whole picture of how bad the cycle was for the Israelites. Um, and that was the Ammonites and the Amalekites. And so what is their significance? Uh, com the commentator Eric Redman has this to say. He says, the rearing of Moab, the Ammonites, and the Amalekites is an indicator that the idolatry and resulting judgment are sending Israel backwards as a society. They become enslaved to the offspring of the daughters of Lot that came from living in Sodom and Gomorrah, the Moabites and Ammonites. They are enslaved to the children of Amalek, the first nation they defeated after crossing the Red Sea. They have lost the city of Jericho, which was conquered under Joshua. Backwards to Sodom and Gomorrah's same-sex society. Backwards across the Jordan, where they feared the children would be destroyed by nations. And backwards across the Red Sea to the place where the king commanded children will be, children be killed. Backwards they go for 18 years years 18 years now it's not just that an alliance being built but Moab and Ammonites they were blood relatives so it wasn't like they were not they didn't know their captors there was history so they're being oppressed by family by blood relatives they're being oppressed by a people that they've already conquered. And yet now they're under their rule. Eglon is set up in Jericho, the city of Palms. And one thing that we know about Jericho at that time is it had plenty of uh, avail availability of water. And so this was kind of a no-brainer alliance to make. But it all came down to their own benefit, power, water, prosperity, it really is a picture of self-indulgence. They wanted to rule over Israel. They wanted to have the power of everything. And so several questions could be asked. Why would God allow the, the oppression of his people? Isn't God a loving God? If God is a loving God, why would he choose to allow his people to suffer? Don't we ask that same question today? If God is a loving God, why do people suffer? In this instance, we've answered that question. And the question is, 
Because they were disobedient. And their disobedience, their turning away from God, their taking their eyes off of God, brought consequences. Disobedience brings consequences. It brings discipline into our life. Now, discipline is, is never pleasant to experience, but it's, it's a good thing. We see a couple passages that help to uh, remind us of the goodness of discipline. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12 says, Do not despise the Lord's instruction, my son. Do not loathe his discipline, for the Lord disciplines the one he loves, just as a father disciplines the son in whom he delights. Hebrews 12, 9 through 11 says, Furthermore, we had human fathers discipline us, and we respected him. Shouldn't we submit even more to the Father of spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them. He does it, but he does it for our benefit so that we can share his holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peace fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. You know, as parents, sometimes we have to ask the question of ourselves, would we cause, be maybe intentional, to allow discomfort or inconvenience in our children's lives so that long-term safety and wisdom can be formed? As a parent, should we allow our kids to face their consequences and have to learn a lesson and help teach them through that so that in the long run, wisdom can be developed. It's hard. It's what we see a picture of what God does with us. At times when we choose to take our eyes off of him, he doesn't immediately come in and swoop us up and save us from our, the consequences of our disobedience. It's kind of that term, you made your bed now, you got to lie in it, you got to sleep in it. And sometimes we have to do that. Now, I'm not talking about things like your child is in the yard and running out into the middle of the street and you're like, well, I guess, guess you'll learn. No, I mean... Uh, we don't want to, you know, for safety reasons, you know, there's a, there's a limit. There's a line there. But as a child, I think of this. Do you, do you ever remember receiving punishment and hearing your parents say these famous words, this hurts me more than it does you? <laughs> as a kid, I can remember hearing that and go, yeah, right. Sure it does. You don't understand the pain that you're causing me. But as, as parents who have to discipline and love, and with the long game in view, we get it. We get it that it hurts to see our children suffer and go through things, but it's worth it. This loving discipline and, and, and oppression was what Israel was going through. The verses in Proverbs and Hebrews express God's loving discipline to grow us and bring honor to him, our Father. It would be easy for us as parents to step in and just rescue our kids. But we have to ask ourselves, what are they going to learn? What are they going to learn? How ultimately does that help shape them as an individual? And we use God's word as guide for that. Because God doesn't immediately come in and swoop us up when we have been disobedient. But this is where we get to our critical part of our text. So our disobedient and oppressed people. So at this point, our secret agent has received all the background information. Ethan Hunt has received his information as to what's happening. And now comes these famous words, your mission, should you choose to accept it. That's what's coming next. What we see from this transition in our story is this. When we cry out in repentance of our disobedience, He is faithful to forgive. When we cry out for salvation, He is faithful to save.
And then through 15, through verse 30, we see that a people are rescued. A people rescued. God heard the cry of the people, and he answered by sending Ehud. Now, this is really where our character, our main character, Ehud, departs from our Ethan Hunt from Mission Possible. Now, we know Ethan Hunt, played by Tom Cruise. Does that guy ever age? I mean, he looks the same as he did in the 80s when he made Top Gun. I mean, for crying out loud. But Ehud is not a Tom Cruise. Ehud, in fact, is he's described as a left-handed man. And the text choice in the description in the original language would seem to indicate that Ehud was disabled in the right hand or there was some sort of accident or whatever that he didn't have use of his right hand. It would point to a disability. Now, if there was any warriors in that time, they were right-handed. And we read in our text that he... He strapped the uh, dagger to his left thigh, or his right thigh. And so, in that time, a right-handed warrior would have a dagger strapped to his left thigh, so it would be easily grabbed for, uh, for battle. And so, if you can picture this, this is why he wasn't perceived as a threat. Because he was coming before the king, he was disabled in his right hand, no warrior was ever left-handed. And if they were to do a, a weapon search, it's not like today, you know, walk through a metal detector and have a wand. It would be, he's disabled, he's no threat. Um, they would check just maybe the left thigh, just, just to be sure that he's not carrying a weapon. It's not there. Okay, you can go through. So he was, he was not perceived as a threat. And so because he wasn't perceived as a threat, he's an unlikely rescuer. That's why they call him a left-handed rescuer. So he carried the tribute to the king, got the king's attention, was able to get as far as he did, but then he returned alone to ask for a private meeting with the king. And he was granted that meeting because he wasn't perceived as a threat. Matter of fact, he's not a threat at all because what did the king do? He dismissed the rest of his people. He told them to go away. So all of his attendants went away. Warren Wiersbe reminds us, he says, never underestimate the good that one person can do who is filled with the Spirit of God and obedient to the will of God. Never underestimate the good that one person can do who is filled with the Spirit of God and obedient to the will of God. And this is where we pick up our story. This is where we would have, have the uh, intense music starting to play. We see that at the images near Gilgal, Ehud returned and said, King Eglon, I have a secret message for you. The king said silence, and all of his attendants left him. Then Ehud approached him while he was sitting alone in his upstairs room where it was cool. Just pause here. So it was not uncommon in, in a home in that era to have a separate room uh, there was an upstairs room, and how it was how it was built around it was the coolest room, not like awesome cool, like temperature cool. That a king would be able to sit there and sit on his throne. He would also have a chamber pot there. Chamber pot, if you're not sure what that is, it's where he could use to go to the bathroom. And so that way, the king could be in more comfort. He wouldn't have to come out of the cool room and go to where, the, where the, the restroom is. He could stay in his cool room on his throne and just use the chamber pot to go to the bathroom and relieve himself. So that's important to know as we work our way through this story. So it was, they're up in this room. Uh, Ehud says, I have a message for you. The king stood up from his throne, and as soon as he stood up from his throne, Ehud reached with his left hand, took a sword from his right, right thigh, and plunged it into his belly, not just the blade, but clear into the handle. And it says that because of the fatness of Eglon, the fat closed over it so that Ehud did not withdraw the sword from his belly and waste. 
everything came out. And so we see, as we go through this, Ehud escapes. And while he was gone, Eglon's servants came in, and they looked and found the doors of the upstairs room locked and thought he was relieving himself in the cool room. One, they might have been surprised by the doors were locked, but they're not going to say anything. You know, king's in there relieving himself. We can smell it because it all spilt out when the dagger went in. And um, they say that the way the door was, they could probably even see it. All right, so it was obvious to the attendants what was going on. And the servants then waited until they became embarrassed and, and saw uh, that he had still not opened the doors of the upstairs room. So what did they do? They took the key and opened the doors. And there was their Lord lying dead on the floor. Now, I don't know about you and your house. There's usually at least one member of your house where you start to wonder if they're still alive. Like, I have not seen them for quite some time. What's going on? It's becoming embarrassing. Well, that's what these king or these attendants were thinking, like, what in the world? But they went and got the keys and opened the door. And there they found their Lord lying dead on the floor. And while this was all going on, Ehud has escaped. He's locked the door. He's gone out the window. And what is Ehud doing? Well, he, <coughs> excuse me. The story gets just so exciting. Uh, after he escapes, he arrives back at the camp and he blows the ram's horn throughout the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came down with him and from hill country and he became their leader. And he says, follow me. The Lord has handed over your enemies, the Moabites, to you. So they followed him, captured uh, the fords of the Jordan. And they did that so there could not be an escape. We wouldn't allow anyone to cross over. And at that time, they struck down about 10,000 Moabites, all stout and able-bodied men. Not one of them escaped. And Moab became subject to Israel that day. And the land had peace for 80 years. And what we can see in the story, and there's more details that we can, we can get into, we don't need to get into, about what Ehud did and and his plan of attack. We don't want to get lost in those details to the bigger picture. And what we see throughout this story and Ehud's rescue is that when we cry out in repentance of our disobedience, he is faithful to forgive. 1 John 1 9 makes it really clear for us. It says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When we cry out in repentance of our disobedience, he's faithful to forgive. But we also see that when we cry out for salvation, he is faithful to save. Romans 10, 9 is such a great passage. It makes it so clear. It says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart, he has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The great thing about when we crowd in repentance of our disobedience, he's faithful to forgive what we see in 1 John 1, 9. What we see that salvation is offered in Romans 10, 9 is nowhere in Scripture does it tell us that somehow we have to clean up our act before we can come to God. We see this cycle of what's going on with the Israelites they didn't clean up their act. They recognized the mess that they were in. They recognized that they were not following God, and they repented. They cried out to God for forgiveness and for salvation, and he answered. 
And that is the message for us today. We can call out to God. We don't have to somehow put our life back together and then come to God. He says, come as you are. Call out to me. He is faithful to forgive. He is faithful to save. So where does this story leave us? A disobedient people, an oppressed people, but a rescued people. Israel was caught in this cycle of sin. One would think this dramatic story and rescue would have made a lasting impact. It did for 80 years. But then it was over. We see at the end of 80 years, Ehud's life is done. Ehud dies. And then the cycle starts again. And then another judge comes in. See, Ehud is a is what we call a type, a type of something greater to come, pointing to something even better in the future. And, and what we see is, is Ehud as a rescuer, a savior, points to Jesus, a greater rescuer, a greater savior, one that it will last forever. <coughs> we see that uh, Jesus, in chapter 53 in Isaiah, he is an unlikely, unlikely hero as well. He tells us that, uh, that Jesus would be unimpressive, would be nothing to draw uh, attention to himself. Matter of fact, he would, be re- he would be rejected by those around him. He was not a likely hero. And that's what we see in, in the passage that Aubrey had read for us in 1 Corinthians. Not only the, the picture of, of how God chose what seemed to be insignificant to the world, but also a message for us. And that we don't have to be perfect. We don't have to have all the right things and, and have the right personality and the right, the right look to be used by God. 1 Corinthians 1, 28 through 30 says, God has chosen what is insignificant and despised in the world. What is viewed as nothing. To bring to nothing what is viewed as something. So that no one may boast in his presence. It is from him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became wisdom from God for us. Our righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. You see, Jesus chose to accept the mission to break that cycle of enslavement to sin, to be our Savior. The difference of where we are at in history, we don't have to wait for him to rise up. He's already come. He's already conquered sin and death. That's what we celebrated a few weeks back in Easter. Our Savior has come. The rescue has been provided. We just have to be willing to accept it. It reminds me of a uh, just an older illustration you may have heard it before, but there's uh, an area where uh, there was flood coming in. And this person saw that flood was coming and so got up on the roof and uh, to, to be saved. And they began praying, asking, God's in, you know, help me. And as the flood waters were coming in, emergency crews were driving in in their vehicles and, and they, they called up to the person on the roof, said, come on down, we're here to rescue. And the person says, no, no, no. I'm praying that God will save me and refused to come down as the rescue workers went on. And a little bit later, the, the water was up about halfway up the house and, and here comes the National Guard and a boat. And they say, come on down, we'll, we'll get you to safety. And the person says, no, no, I have prayed and asked God to save me. And so they left. And the water is up now to the roof and the person's on the roof and here comes a helicopter. And they say, you know, they call down, grab onto the road, grab onto the helicopter, we're going to take you to safety. No, 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 I I'm, I'm, I'm pray and ask God to, to save me. The person eventually dies. Brutal story, they died. They didn't take rescue. And so, and I don't know how the conversation goes in heaven, I've never been there. But the person is standing and says, God, why? Why didn't you save me? I prayed and asked you to save me. And God goes, well, I sent the rescue workers. I sent the National Guard. I sent the helicopter. 
I sent you three opportunities to be saved, and you didn't take any of them. Well, that's, there's nothing else needs to be done to be clear to us how to be saved from our sin. Jesus has been set, sent. He has been sent to rescue us. The work is done. All we have to do is, are we willing to accept the work that Jesus did on the cross to defeat death? The difference between Ehud and us, or Ehud and Jesus, is that Jesus' salvation and his rescue is eternal. We no longer have to be in the bondage or the oppression of sin. Dale Ralph Davis says this, For our real bondage does not consist of Moabites or fat kings or physical and economic oppression. No left-handed Savior can break us free from our tyrant sin. But there is one with nail-scarred hand who can and does. The only tragedy in our story will be if, having this Savior, we do not cry to him for help. For Yahweh has raised up for us a Savior, Jesus, who shall save his people from their sins. As we close and I invite the worship team up, we have to ask ourselves a question. One, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, are you willing to accept this gift of grace and mercy? And if you've never started or never come to that point in your life to begin a relationship with Jesus, I, I pray that today is the day. And I, if you're here in the sanctuary, I would invite you to go back to our prayer area uh, while the music is playing. And, and talk to one of our prayer team members. Talk to one of us pastors. I'll try not to cough on you. You can talk from distance. If you're online, I would encourage you to visit with our host. They would love to be able to share with you as well of what it means to begin that relationship with Jesus. But as a believer, are you caught in a cycle? Are you caught in this cycle? Has God brought something to your mind that you need to address? And you need to be restored into that right relationship with God? What has taken place of God in your life? There's grace and mercy for us to come to God. 1 John 1, 9 provides us that comfort and reassurance of God's faithfulness to us to forgive. God desires for us to be in a right relationship with him. God desires for us to choose him. So let's cry out to him for forgiveness. Cry out to him for salvation. Because he's faithful to provide both. Let's continue worship as Ryan leads us in song. Uh, let's stand together as we sing. Hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That Christ alone, that he's our cornerstone. Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but coldly trust in Jesus' name. Sing that again. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood.
Just in his righteousness alone will fall a stand before the throne. Fall a stand before the throne. to your arms and don't
God, we sing this last song. We just worship you. We know that even when we don't see it, you're working. You are here. Stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. Never stop, never stop working. Never stop. Light in the darkness, my God, that is who you are. We thank you that even when it seems like there's no way ahead of us, that you make a way, that you keep your promises, that even when we don't see it, you're at work, Lord, that uh, even though we don't feel it sometimes, that you are continually at work amongst us. And so we trust you, we place our faith and trust in in Jesus today, our heart will sing no other name but the name of Jesus. We worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
Well, thank you for being here today, and uh, we serve a great God, don't we? He loves us deeply. He has grace and mercy available for each of us. We just have to ask, be willing to accept that. And let's live in that, in that aspect, the life that is, is deeply loved, and let's share that news with those that we come across in our daily lives. So with that, have a great rest of the Sunday. Uh, you are dismissed. Know you were loved.